Welcome to the Firebelly Social Show. We're focused on talking to food and beverage brands that are on a mission to make the world better. Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Firebelly Social Show. I'm your host, Duncan. This is a unique show where we chat with founders and leaders of mission-driven food and beverage brands. So ain't every brand that qualifies to be on here, every brand we talk to, every person we talk to is driven by their mission to make the world better. So thank you for tuning in to this latest episode. Uh, we have a great show lined up for you with uh, Kale Nelson, who's the Chief Commercial Officer of Local Hive Honey. But first, this episode is brought to you by Firebelly Marketing. At Firebelly, we help mission-based food and beverage brands bring people closer together through social media marketing. So if you're ready to use social media to blow up your community and excitement around your food and beverage brand, go to firebellymarketing.com. So, you know, I am really excited in general by innovation and by people that are just driven. And that's why I'm so excited to welcome, welcome Kale Nelson from Local Hive Honey. Kale's chief commercial officer of Local Hive. And he's doing some amazing things, has done some amazing things, and he's most excited to be here to talk about their new line of honey-based hot sauces. So with no further ado, welcome, Kale. Yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. It's nice to meet you. My man, let me ask you this. Um, Local Hive Honey isn't just about raw honey blends anymore. You guys are shaking up the condiment aisle. Tell tell us about the new line of uh, hot sauces. Yeah, so uh, a little bit about Local Hive, honey. We've been around for 100 years, actually. This is our 100-year anniversary of selling 100% uh, U.S. local raw honey for 100 years. So um, we started to kind of look at the honey space and, you know, decide, well, where do we go next? You know, we, we've done a great job in getting distribution. We're pretty much every retailer across the U.S. and you know, number one brand in the natural channel, number two in the conventional channel. And we started to say, well, where else can we take honey? Uh, we didn't want to offer another Me Too type honey product that you, you you see on the shelves today. So we we started to kind of look at different categories across the store and, you know, which ones are growing, uh, which ones, you know, need a little bit of development on the innovation side. And we started to see this uh, big trend around sweet and heat. It's kind of one of the, the trends of the year and the last couple of years are sweet heat trends, contrasting flavor profiles, alternating flavors on the sweet heat side. So that kind of led us to take a look at a bunch of different um, data metrics within uh, our data partner spins. So we went to spins and we started to um, put together uh, some studies and, and we we um, uh, we worked with them on an ANU study, an attitude and usage study. And we said, well, which are these uh, product concepts are most appealing to customers? And we had four or five different product concepts we went to them with. and. Uh, we engage their their insights te team to go and look at the data and look at the concepts and and see which scored the best uh, around um, these different ideas. And the one that 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 got to the very top of the list was honey based hot sauce. So taking the sweet heat trend uh, that you see in in a lot of different categories and and bringing some sweetness to hot sauce. So we've got a line of seven honey based hot sauces, uh, which I'll get to a little bit more of those in a second. And and, and gotten to the point to where we surveyed 1,500 hot sauce consumers and had a 96% uh, consumer acceptance to that product proposition. So led us to say, well, that makes sense to go down that route through looking at data, surveying consumers, and seeing what they're interested in. 96%. That's amazing. That's amazing. And just so our listeners can understand a bit more about that sophisticated process, when you're looking at all those data points, what happens when you look at all the data? Is the next step kind of to tell a story around that and take that story to the retailers? Is that how that works? Yeah, so it's to, to first understand what consumers are looking for. So what is the usage occasion? What are their attitudes around the product concept? What do they think about label design? What do they think about brand statements? What do they think about flavor profiles? And we started with a wide range of flavor profiles and and then uh, through our consumer research had found that, you know, there was seven of them that, that had uh, risen to the top in terms of, of interest, consumer interest. So 
we then started to refine them a little bit more. We didn't want to get too specialty. We didn't want to get too basic. Uh, we also looked at our competition in that space and said, well, we don't want to come out with something similar to what they're doing. So how can we not only be differentiated, but appeal to a mass audience and not a very niche consumer base where you can tend to get sometimes too specialized with product development and a little bit uh, too narrow. So we, we, we cast the net out to these consumers and surveyed a, a number of different uh, flavors and 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 line uh, came up with these seven. So four of them are, are national kind of SKUs that can appeal to pretty much any consumer. And then we've got uh, three regional SKUs. And when I say regional SKUs, is local hive honey is all about um, local honey on a national scale. So we work with 200 local beekeepers across the U.S. We only buy U.S. honey. Uh, we've never bought foreign honey. Uh, it's always been supporting local communities, supporting local beekeepers by buying local honey. So we've got a local honey for every portion of the U.S. So in Texas, we have a local Texas honey, and that's sourced from beekeepers in Texas. In Southern California, a local Southern California honey. And in the, in the New England states, a local New England honey. In Colorado, a local Colorado honey. Well, Bees are pollinating off of different plants and, and flowers all across the U.S. And what happens is you get a unique flavor profile depending on what those bees are pollinating from in different areas. So in Southern California, it's going to be more sage and citrus. In Texas, it's going to be more tallow. In Florida, it's going to be Brazilian pepper. And what that does is it creates a unique flavor profile and a unique color based upon those native plants and flowers. So back to the honey hot sauce side of things, we took the regional positioning of regional peppers and regional honey. So we have a local Southwest uh, with hatch chili honey hot sauce. Uh, we have a local Southeast uh, with cayenne pepper honey hot sauce, a local Texas uh, with chipotle honey hot sauce. So we've taken that uh, unique positioning that we have in honey with regional honeys and we paired it with regional peppers to have some more localized offerings from a honey hot sauce to go along with some national flavors like sriracha and original and habanero and mango habanero. So that's kind of the approach we took. And we went all the way to asking consumers about a number of flavor profiles like ghost pepper or scotch bonnet or Thai chili. And uh, we found those interesting as well, but they didn't get as much consumer acceptance as the seven we ended up landing on. That's amazing. The, I know the ghost pepper tends to uh, make some people just tremble by just hearing it. So yeah. I, I, yeah. I, it isn't as hot as a habanero, right? No. Uh, well, yeah, I think it's a little bit hotter. A ghost pepper is. And then the habanero is a little bit below it. But, you know, another interesting thing that we had found in our in our in our A&U study with spins is that um, consumers are looking for approachable hot sauces. I mean, the trend in the hot sauce industry has always been like light you up hot, like the hotter you can get, the better. Well, we found that there was a consumer need for sweet, uh, sweeter hot sauces, some that aren't as hot, that are a bit more approachable. So that's kind of where we took the sweet heat angle of, of sweetening it with honey. Honey is the number one ingredient in every one of our recipes, but they still are a little bit hot as well. So you get that contrasting flavor profile and it's, it's serving a consumer need in the hot sauce category that doesn't really exist right now because all of them are just really, really hot hot sauces. But in our research, we found that consumers really wanted approachable hot sauces that weren't super hot. And I think the other piece, at least um, for me, is that I, I want a hot sauce. I, you know, I'm excited if it's going to be sweet, but I don't want it to be filled with sugar. You yeah, know, I, I think the idea of honey, which is natural, our body knows how to process honey. A body knows, you know, exactly what to do, as opposed to some of the other things that you see in the space. So that's really exciting. Now, how, uh, 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 Kale, tell us about the launch. What's going to happen with the launch? When is it happening? Where is it happening? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and by the way, all of the honey hot sauces are less than two grams of sugar. So all of them have um, not very much sugar at all, if any, uh, just sweetened from the honey. Um, honey is the number one ingredient in every single one. It's not water, or, you know, what you see in some of the other hot sauces. So. The texture is 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 fantastic because the honey kind of adds a little bit of some density and thickness that makes it pretty appealing. But from a flavor standpoint, too, um, that was something we also found out in the research is it's consumers don't just want hot. They want very definable flavors, chipotle, habanero, you know, hatch chili, sriracha. 
So the flavor angle combined with the sweet angle was very important for us to deliver on that product proposition based on our research was flavor and the sweet heat. Those are the main things we ended up achieving in, in the in the final outcome. And, and the goal was to launch this product with one customer to start. And we chose Whole Foods and Whole Foods worked with us on the product development, helped us kind of refine a little bit of the flavor profiles, got their opinions around the packaging. And um, we wanted to make sure that it was appealing to that consumer and that audience. And, and, and our consumer research actually told us that they're the most open to trying um, unique flavor profiles was that Whole Foods consumer. So we went to them with the product idea. We are the number one brand at Whole Foods by a, by a long shot, actually, in the honey category. We've got an already defined consumer base in Whole Foods who's buying local hive today. They carry six SKUs in every single store of local hive of our whole portfolio of products. So we said it's a consumer who's interested in innovation from a flavor profile standpoint. It's a bit of a higher end consumer who's, you know, uh, opening uh, to trying something that's, you know, a, a bit more on the premium end. Uh, and they're the number one brand, uh, the number one retailer for us today in the natural space. So it, it makes it seem like that's a good partner for us. So we went to them with the idea and, and they loved the idea and they helped us kind of, you know, get it to the point of launching. And it's going into every single Whole Foods store this month. You'll have, we'll have four to six SKUs in every single Whole Foods store. And we're launching with all kinds of consumer support. So during the month of June, we'll have a whole end cap, you know, at the end of the aisle devoted to honey hot sauce and local hive honey. So you'll have our core honey line sitting next to our hot sauce products for the first two weeks of June. And then during the month of July and August, we're gonna be on their discovery end cap. Uh, Whole Foods has come out for all the innovation they're launching on new brands. They've got this new thing called the discovery end cap and their discovery end cap at the end of the aisle is gonna be devoted to all the unique things they're bringing into their store and they're highlighting those on at the end of the aisle uh, for two months during the summer. And, and we're going to be featured for those two months on all of our hot sauces. You'll be able to find secondary merchandising from June all the way through August. And then we even have a pretty strong back half of the, uh, of the year from a, a promotional in-store standpoint. So they've been a great partner, not only on helping us refine the product development, but then supporting it uh, in store with lots of secondary merchandising to ensure that it's successful. So I have to say Whole Foods has done a nice job with innovation and they've uh, been a, a good partner to go to to launch innovation because they really like to get behind the items they bring in store with a lot of support. Yeah, super cool. The little bird told me that you um, that you, you all were thinking that, you know, just like whiskeys do, with uh, their centennial editions, y'all got some inspiration from the whiskey world. Yeah, we did. So we launched a hundred year anniversary uh, honey, a wildflower honey. And uh, since it was a hundred years, we said, well, what can we do from a label design standpoint? And we came out with a 1924 edition honey. And we were looking at different whiskey brands and, and, and noticed that people like to brand their, the year that they were founded as the main messaging point on their label. So we said, why, why not come out with a 1924 edition honey? And uh, it's a black and gold. So we kind of took inspiration from, you know, the era that uh, that 1924 and the golden age and the roaring 20s and kind of. Uh, when you look at our label design, that really comes to life along with uh, the, the small batch 1924, you know, centennial edition uh, branding. So that is an item that we launched into the natural channel as well with Whole Foods and Sprouts. And it, it just gives us a reason to uh, talk about our centennial uh, celebration of 100 years and then, you know, our support of American beekeepers because, that's really key to who we are as a company is our support of local American beekeepers. And the reason for that is you probably don't know, but 75% of the honey consumed in the U.S. is foreign honey. Um, that has gone up tremendously year over year over year over year. So it used to be 10 years ago, it was 50% of the honey was foreign. It's now up to 75% of the honey is foreign. And the reason that it's so important for us to support local American beekeepers and, and all of our honey and our hot sauces too are all obviously U.S. honey because that's who we are. We've never sourced foreign honey is 
And why that's important is the more honey that's sourced uh, out of this country, the negative impact it has on pollination, the less beekeepers there are, the less bees there are, the less pollination there is, which means not as many fruits and nuts and vegetables and seeds and oils that you see on shelf all across the U.S. Well, all of that is a result of, of pollination. And if you don't have really good pollination and you have less beekeepers and less bees, it has such a negative impact on agriculture and farming. So um, when you see a lot of other honey brands going out there and sourcing foreign honey, it really impacts that American beekeeper because they don't have a place to go and sell their honey. Um, so for us, you know, it, it's very important to buy from them because it gives them obviously income and it allows them to sell their product to a packer like us who, who only buys U.S. honey. And not to mention the overall kind of conservation aspect of keeping our plants here in the U.S. pollinated and the whole cycle there going as well. I think it's, it's really I, I, I bet you I did not know that until I started uh, researching for the show. I'm sure most people don't know that. And. My, I guess my sort of to the side, not as important, I'm not here to diss anybody, but what is, what are the kind of, dis I'm, I'm guessing the sort of lack of transparency with foreign honey in general. It's like, where is it coming from? Is it blended? You know, what, what's the story with that? As opposed to you all who are very transparent. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm not saying that foreign honey is bad by any means, because I don't want to put that stigma that say if you buy foreign honey that it's it's tainted or it's adulterated because, you know, there is there is foreign honey that is good that, you know, has quality honey that you can buy. But uh, for us, it's important to buy U.S. honey because of the things that I just mentioned, but also because we know these beekeepers we're buying from. We have worked with them for a long time. Uh, we know their beekeeping practices. We, we know the quality of product that they're selling to us, the quality of the honey we're getting. We do pollen testing on all of our honey to ensure that, that the honey that's coming from that one particular area is made up of pollen sources from that area. So we do the pollen testing on our honey, but it's really the relationships we have with these beekeepers. And when you buy honey on the foreign market and you don't know who that beekeeper is and you're just buying it based on a price, uh, you, you don't necessarily know kind of what you're getting sometimes. It could have issues with, um, you know, being adulterated with, 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 you know, rice syrup or beet syrup. And there's actually a pretty cool Netflix documentary called Rotten. They have a, 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 um, an episode on honey called Lawyers, Guns and Honey. And it's the first episode on Rotten for Netflix. And it's all about adulteration in the honey industry and the transshipment of of honey from China into Argentina, into the US. And um, sometimes when you're buying foreign honey on the open market, there could be issues with adulteration. And I'm not saying it happens all the time, but it does happen to the point to where, you know, it was featured in a, a documentary on Netflix. So, um, and the, the other reason that consumers will go and buy, uh, or not consumers, but, but brands or packers will go buy honey on the foreign market is it's cheaper. It's cheaper to buy foreign honey than it is to buy US honey. Um, it depends on where it's coming from, of course, but Viet Vietnam and India are places where honey's a lot cheaper than, you know, say Brazil or Argentina, which is a, a little bit of a step up from Vietnam or India from a pricing standpoint. And then you go to the U.S., which is probably the highest uh, market to buy honey from. But I think when you're buying from a beekeeper, you know, you've dealt with them for a long time. Um, it, it's it's worth paying a little bit more because you're getting a quality product that is representative of an area that's listed on our packaging. So that's kind of why it's important for us to buy uh, from those beekeepers because of those relationships and, and because of the impact it has on farming and agriculture in the U.S. Yeah, it was, uh, I was um, listening to American Honey by Lady A this morning. And I think uh, we, <laughs> I, I, I would I would uh, urge uh, local hive to consider Charlie Crockett for an American honey song. <laughs> yeah. Speak to the people, you know, about the, the, the loveliness of American honey. Now, um, Kale, you're no you're no stranger to uh, innovation. And, and, and I'm sure in your role as chief commercial officer, you've got different hats you wear. What role does innovation play? What other kind of exciting things do you work on? Yeah, so I mean, we've got several other product lines that we are we have in the pipeline now. Honey Hot Sauce is the first. Uh, you and I are going to have to 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 get together here on our next innovation launch, which is actually coming up in in uh, September. 
And uh, I can tell you it is, uh, it is, is a pretty exciting uh, new product that, that we're coming out with and we're launching it with one particular customer. I always like to start uh, from an innovation standpoint with one particular customer that you can really get behind. You can drive trial, you can drive secondary merchandising, you can ensure that you get uh, a successful product launch before you go everywhere. Because I, I find that sometimes brands will come out with innovation and just try to do it everywhere they possibly can get it into distribution. Well. You know, I like to make sure that it's a successful product, that there's consumer acceptance and that you can really put support behind it with one particular customer to then develop a case study to take to other retailers and say, well, here's the type of traction. Here's the merchandising. Here's the support plan. Here's the digital plan, the social plan, the in-store plan uh, that worked with uh, our trial customer that we launched with uh, to ensure that it was successful. And then you can replicate that elsewhere. When you kind of go in as a, a an approach of just getting it in everywhere, you know, it can sometimes you don't have the consumer support, you don't have the dollars to fund it, you don't have the slotting dollars, the promotional dollars, the social dollars, the digital dollars to give everyone all that support right out of the gate. Uh, unless you're some, you know, large billion dollar company, that's a different story. But when you're, uh, in, you know, the, the size of our company, I, I think it's always important to develop that case study that you can then take everywhere else. So. We did that with the honey hot sauce. We're doing it with two new product launches we're coming out with this year. Uh, the one I mentioned is going to be in, in August time frame, and then there's going to be another one in the September time frame, right behind this one. So I can, I can tell you for the last year, I've been very involved on product development and innovation because we're going to bring three new product lines to market this year all with three national customers uh, to then go and take elsewhere after the success with those first initial three customers. That's so fascinating and it makes complete sense to sort of be focused with your resources um, on launching with one particular customer at a time, building a case study and then taking it, taking it to the next one. That's really good. I think the original way we connected, shout out to uh, Mark Haas from Telsman Group who, uh, when he recorded with us, he was like, you have to talk to Kale. So. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was great. I mean, they they helped us on our Honey Hot Sauce product development. And um, I can't say enough about that group from an innovation standpoint. Uh, we don't have an in-house uh, food science and innovation team. Um, you know, you've got a very small marketing team in-house that we have, but we outsource a lot of things on the marketing side, like most companies our size do. Um, and then we work with those partners who are specialized in different areas. So we've got a digital team, we've got a social team, we outsource the digital team, we outsource a product development team, we outsource and Mark and his company is who we used on the product development front for the honey hot sauce. And they were great giving us, uh, uh, taking our research that we got from spins from an attitude and usage and flavor profile and, and, and product proposition. And then we took that to them and said, we need you to develop formulas that have honey as the first ingredient, that deliver on these pepper profiles, that deliver on the sweet heat element. And um, I worked with them on, you know, five, six rounds of product development on the honey hot sauces to get to a point to uh, what you'll see today when you go into Whole Foods is all of them are very unique, distinctive, different colors, very different flavor profiles, and they deliver on you know what we 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 work with them on from the from the onset. So it's always interesting because when you work on product development, it's always done in such a small batch setting, and then you scale that up from a small batch setting to a larger batch setting, and you go from very small bench top samples to very large production kettles and. I can tell you from a consistency standpoint, where we started on the small batch side of things is where we ended up on the larger production side of things, which is always great to see. But, you know, working with them on what the viscosity needs to be, you know, who you're sourcing from, what the pepper profiles need to be, like, who is that supplier? So they've got a whole network of suppliers that they use and have been successful in, in condiment product launches. And, and we went to them because uh, they were the most reputable partner that uh, could help us achieve what we were, we were wanting to in the final product. What a great endorsement. Mark Haas, shout out to you. And <laughs> while we're on the, on the subject of shout outs, let's give a shout out to Diana Frick from uh, Retail Voodoo and also Scott Rice, who is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, one of the top recruiters on the natural space who we both know, uh, Kale. so there's that. I, I wanted to, to just dive a bit deeper 
into uh, some of the great work that you all do as a company. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what you all do with Pace and the Butterfly Pavilion and a little bit about more about that. Yeah, so we have a, a very important cause marketing partnership. Um, and for us, you know, it ties back to that pollinator education piece that I mentioned earlier around the importance pollinators play around agriculture and farming and crops across the U.S. And, you know, why why it's so important that, you know, there are pollinator awareness initiatives out there and, and PACE is pollinator awareness through conservation and education and it's a it's a actually international initiative that um, was started by a company called the Butterfly Pavilion in Colorado. Our company being Colorado based, the Butterfly Pavilion in Westminster, Colorado. Um, you know, it's a they have a, a, a huge um, facility there that's all about conservation around pollinators. And um, one of them, uh, their initiatives is PACE, and that's the Pollinator Awareness Through Conservation and Education. And a portion of every bottle of local hives sold goes to support pollinator education through that PACE initiative. So we work with them very closely. You go into their facility in Westminster, Colorado. They've got a huge butterfly conservatory that is really cool and, and interesting to see. And they have a whole wall at their facility devoted towards pollinator education and it's local hive featured on the wall talking about our support of pollinators and our support of pace so we work with them very closely and they build pollinator districts so as you start to see expansions of neighborhoods and suburbs and in every city you're seeing it right so there's you know the the the, the center center city ends up you know moving outwards and outwards and outwards and what happens is that you continue to see uh, suburbs being built, uh, buildings taking place, and it's coming at the expense of land, right? So there's less land, there's more suburbs, which means there's less places for bees and pollinators to go and 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 find, you know, nectar and pollen. So what the butterfly pavilion does through their PACE initiative is they ensure that it's done in an environmentally friendly way. So they build pollinator districts. They make sure that you know, native plants and flowers when suburbs are being built, that they're maintained and that they don't completely destroy all the, the pollinator habitats as you see communities expand. So they go in and work with developers and work with, um, you know, uh, different, you know, um, whether it's, uh, you know, strip malls or, or, or um, you know, uh, communities or housing communities, developmental co companies, and they work with them to ensure that they leave some of that land devoted towards pollinators so that, you know, it doesn't completely destroy their habitats and, 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 you know, that you see kind of bees continuing and pollinators continue to have places to go and, and collect pollen and nectar. So that's what they do is that they do that on a, on a national scale. Um, and actually they've got some international initiatives as well. So they're, they're trying to bring a lot of uh, awareness to around the importance of making sure that, that pollinators have, um, you know, places to go and, and, uh, you know, have fruits and, I mean, uh, plants and flowers to pollinate from so i mean it's it, it, i mean it's it's safe to say that without this kind of effort and without our american bees there would be no farm to table right there'd be no local food without bees so it's a it's a hugely important uh initiative and something to think about uh, i want to i want to ask you you know with us running a social media marketing agency i was so impressed by your social I mean, the uh, I, I would, especially Instagram, I was noticing how high the engagement is. And that is just so impressive. Are there any tips you can give to other brands, uh, things you've learned along the way? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, we we have a great agency partner that we work with on the social side of things. Uh, company's called Johnson and Seekin. Um, they're based in in Dallas and Denver, so they've got two offices in Dallas and Denver. And they are a great group of people. I've worked with them actually for the last 10 years on several different brands. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the great thing that they do is um, they're very focused on the analytics around engagement. So it's not it's not just serving content to build a following that may not be engaging with your content. Uh, it's all about serving those social following content that they like, that they're interested in. So we partner with a company called Rival IQ, where we get all of our engagement stats. Oh. And we look at us versus our competition. We've got three top competitors we look at who 
are on a similar uh, playing field from a national brand standpoint. And we look at all their engagement stats on every post, uh, all of their content. What are they consumers engaging the most with? It's not just going out there and giving a, a giveaway to people to grow your fan base because you, you may have a giveaway where you're giving something away that's really cool and you'll get all this engagement for this one giveaway, but then it'll all fall off after you quit having a giveaway, you're having something on there. So they join and then they get away and then they join and then they get away. So we want to make sure that we're serving that content to our followers that resonates with them. We know that uh, our following really likes bee facts and things about American beekeepers and the importance pollinators play. So we have a very loyal following who is very interested in the pollinator side of things. And we also know that there's a huge following around recipes. So what we can do from a recipe standpoint, from a bee fact standpoint, pollinator education standpoint, uh, we know that those are the type of posts consumers like to engage with the most. And, and we look at it and we ensure that we're getting certain benchmarks around engagement on every single post and we monitor it monthly. We monitor it versus our competition monthly. And we say, what's our engagement weight rate? What's their engagement rate? What's the category's engagement rate? And what are the things that are resonating the most with from an engagement standpoint? And that's what we continue to serve consumers is that type of content. So hats off. I mean, hats off to you all and hats off, you know, shout out to Johnson and Seekin for doing a great job with that. That is not an easy task. And I think you see um, you know, coming from me, and we, that's what we do. And that is something that so many brands get lost with. You know, they get lost with uh, either too much data, or too much instinct, and not a combination of both of those. So that's super cool. Uh, it's been a great conversation. I, I, I have to ask, what, which one of the new uh, hot sauces do you particularly dig? <laughs> I knew you were going to put me on the spot about that. Uh, you know, <laughs> cause I have a few of them that I like, so it's kind of hard to. You know, I would probably say the sriracha honey hot sauce is probably my favorite. Uh, it's just got such a distinctive flavor profile. They all do, but I really like the sriracha one a lot. And I'd have to say the second one's probably chipotle. I'm not a huge chipotle guy. I, I've i never just, I've never really liked chipotle peppers, but for some reason, when you add the honey component to chipotle, it, it is such a great flavor that uh, I would have never thought would have been a top one of a uh, top two of mine, but it's probably number two right behind Sriracha for me. So that's super, um, that is super yeah, cool. so they're great. We'll have to send you some and, and definitely, you know, for people to go to Whole Foods and check it out, there'll be, you know, plenty of opportunities to buy it at Whole Foods over the next several months. And, um, you know, they'll, we'll have a lot of exposure there. So, well, and stay tuned. It looks like it looks like Kayla's coming back in August or September to talk about the new products. So we'll keep you updated there. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I'd love to, to get back on and talk about the other innovation we've got planned. I, I wish I could kind of tease it out right now, but uh, you know, I I I, uh, I can't just yet. But we'll have to connect again soon because I'd love to give uh, everyone an update on that front. Well, Kale, this conversation got me so inspired, not just by the hot sauces, but by how committed Local Hive is to supporting the pollinators and the whole food um, ecosystem and the great work you're doing with Whole Foods. Uh, to all our listeners, if those things matter to you, I urge you, if you're not already, to support Local Hive. Check out their honey, their American honey. That's just another song waiting to happen. Their, their hot sauces, which are just dropping at Whole Foods. Uh, you can find them online at localhivehoney.com. And hey, uh, Fire Belly Social Show listeners, let us know what you think of the flavor combos. We're probably going to be get obsessed with them ourselves. So um, super excited that, to thank you, uh, Kyle, so much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you to Mark Haas for uh, you know, recommending that you come. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was great to connect. And uh, thanks again. Look forward thank to talking you. again soon. Thank you. You bet. Everyone, you've been listening to another episode of the Firebelly Social Show, where we chat with uh, founders and leaders of mission-driven food and beverage brands. That's our jam. That's what we love to do. Thank you for listening. And uh, for those of you watching, thank you for watching. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for listening to the Firebelly Social Show. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.